Well, good morning, folks, and uh, today is a day that I've been looking for, and I'm guessing you have too because you're getting real tired of seeing this bay mare. But uh, I think I've got her to the point now where she's ready for a western bit, and what I thought was going to work didn't work, so I'll explain that in a minute. But before I, I want to explain something, is that I'm riding today in this snaffle one-handed. So that that's part of the transition. All the things that I needed to get out of her, I got done in the last two months. And uh, it's not perfect by no means, but I think we've talked about perfect. It's highly overrated. Over time, she'll get really good because they don't want to step on their feet. Now, somebody got a hold of us about neck rein, and, and what I have personally seen, and I'll just use the Southwest as an example. I've seen a lot of guys, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, and they've got a, a rein with a loop in it, and they just do this, and their horse just turns wherever they want them to turn. So I'm, I'm presuming that's what neck reining means. For me personally, if I do this, if I don't use my body and I just turn my horse, it is turning. Okay, what happens over time is that I'm going to start tipping the nose to the outside because I'm pulling on this rein. I'm pulling too hard, okay? If I can just lay it on there, and then I, I add my leg, then I'm not moving my hand too far. I don't want to move my hand. I want my hand to stay right here. So the, the, the term neck reining, when I get ready to turn left the way I ride, the rein does in fact touch the neck. But I don't I don't see it that way. What I see is my leg and my shoulders and my spine turning. And oh by the way, the the rein is in fact touching the neck. So you call it whatever you want. So anyway I, I try to concentrate on keeping my hand here. And like I said, I've seen a lot of guys in the Southwest that they're just, they're right here. They're right on the money. Well, okay, they've got a different way of getting it done, and that's all commendable. I just tend to lean more towards collection and self-courage. Now, this, the second thing is, is the black horse that we did the shoeing video on, the cow boss came, got him, and he's, he went back. He's going to start working for a living. So we're, we hate to see him go, but I also am glad to see him go because he's ready. I've been riding him for about six months, and I feel very comfortable about him making a good ranch horse for whoever they cut him to. And uh, anyway, that black horse I was shoeing, because somebody wanted to see cowboy shoeing, and I still don't understand why, but anyway, right after that, of course, uh, somebody got a hold of me and I'm not sure if it was a question or a statement, but they shared with me about a lot of terms that I have no idea what they meant about shoeing. So, I hate to be literal, but what I do is called cowboy shoeing. Evidently, whoever contacted me is what they call a farrier. So now I know the difference. That's fine. I don't do it for the public. I don't have to know all that stuff. Shoe stays on. You're okay. Now, I'm going to talk about the where we're headed next. I've got my lateral work done and I've got things going. So that's why I moved on to the to the western bit. Now while I'm standing on the ground somebody wanted to know why my horses respect me. If you'll watch my right foot, my right foot, you'll see why horses don't respect you. This is how it can start real easy. So a horse moves its head over to you so that you'll pet it or do something and it puts its head right in your lap and you go like this. You just started disrespect. That's how it works. And then it builds from there. The horse doesn't move you. Period. Well, and what I try to do, something else that's kind of a deal you figured out by now, 
is it takes me a long time to get anything accomplished on a horse. Well, that's kind of the point. And by the time the time is over and being consistent, and since I never lose my temper with a horse, then I guess that's where the mutual respect comes from. Okay, I'll change bridles. Now, last week I was showing you this bit and this bit. And I showed you the, the way the mechanics are set up on it. And I decided to go with this bit because knowing this horse's history, she's pretty, she's pretty troubled. So I did. What I found out was that this bit didn't work. And I'm going to put it on her and show you why. So then I went to this bit. And by the way, the, the way I've been testing these, you can't test a bit in a round corral. I've been out making circles on her, and that's how you decide, because of up and down. And the horse looking at other things. Going around and around in the corral, and you know I don't have an arena. After about... Two trips for a horse is just mindlessly wandering. It's what they call lunging in the English world. And if you ever watch a horse lunging, their nose is always pointed out away from the mishandler. Now, if I need to, I can always go back to this bit. Next weekend we're going to be working cattle and I'll be having this bit with me in the trailer real close by and if things fall apart with this other bit gets too fast or she gets too worried I'll just change bridles. I'm lucky that the people I work for allow me to do such things because this actually is one of the ranch horses. So now the curb bit this is a bit that um, was outsourced to Singapore, I'm sure. It probably cost $9.50, and that was before tariffs. But um, talk about wrinkles and putting a bit in. When you first put it in, it nothing you can't decide because they move their mouth around. Well, as soon as their mouth settles in, you can look. And... Uh, Leather curb strap, one finger, and remember, brand new curb straps stretch after a while because of sweat. And if they don't stretch, it means you're not riding. So, to me, that's just barely a wrinkle. The reason I did that was because. I told you, she's 12, and she probably was ridden in a bit before. But I set it here just for safety's sake, if you want to call it, so that when I rode outside, she wouldn't get in trouble, as in sticking her tongue over the mouthpiece. Now there, when her mouth relaxes, it's right at the corner of the mouth. So it puts it between the molars, and the bridle tooth, if they have one. Well, this is a mare, and she has no bridle tooth. Canine tooth, I don't know what you call it. So she's got plenty of room between the front teeth and the back teeth. The main reason I'm not going to keep riding in this bit is because it's too light. The slicer, the reason why I like them, and I should have remembered that, this bit weighs probably two and a half times more than this bit. So what happened was when I get outside and, and um, walk, trot, low, up and downward transitions, whatever I was doing, she would flash back to her old days of rooting her nose out. And it wasn't a problem to take this bit and stick her nose out because there's nothing to it. So when she tried to do it with this bit, it wasn't very comfortable. She took her head upside down and it went like that in her mouth. And I just kept her moving forward. Because you don't want them running backwards. My point is, that's when it dawned on me that I messed up and got the angle wasn't the important thing. It was the weight of the bit. So, riding in this, everything seemed to work. 
And I'm going to ride her in this bit just to show you some of the things of, to explain what I'm talking about. Now, respect. When you leave, a horse should go with you. If you got them broke to drag, that means they don't respect you. That's another trivial thing in the barnyard. You see somebody dragging a horse out of the barn to try to get on them, then they don't respect that human. There's a million little things that you do wrong that a horse will say, well, okay. If you can't take over, I will. Not a problem. See how our nose automatically raised? Okay. She's going to push on this bit, and and I've got her pretty good, but I'm fine tuning here. And what it means is that to get her where I need her nose, I'm going to have to pull 100 more times than I would with a heavier bit, that just because of the weight sets her head, so I don't have to pull in her mouth. That's what that's what this whole story is all about, incidentally. My bit, that snaffle, if you understand the concept of release, it's a good bit. In this particular situation, my bit was used to transition this horse into a western bit. That's what it was for. And, a good, and everything works out just fine, that bit will never go back on this horse. If I have to, I will, but I, I, don't, I don't plan on it. And the main reason I can say that is because I'm going to ride her for about a month in that slicer outside and by the time I get riding outside and making circles I feel pretty confident that she'll be carrying it because the weight of it made her balance it that's the way bits were designed years and years ago and the California bit makers took all that into consideration so the weight of the bit was the deciding factor now this bit this Ho Chi Minh deal there's nothing wrong with it if I got a horse old enough to vote and I got an eight-year-old little kid that comes and wants to ride, I put I can put that bit on an old gentle as a dead pig horse of mine and then they can ride around and just have a ball all day and I don't have to tell them anything. That's what it's actually going to be for. Now I'd like you to understand that the nose band is being stayed on through this whole thing. My next goal is to get rid of this. By the end of another month, I hope to throw that away, not ever use it on her again. The reason it's still on there is because they have flashbacks and they'll say, oh yeah, I can gap my mouth when things get going. She's got a lot of cow on her, but she also gets pretty nervous because she was overexposed. The higher the mouthpiece, the more angle you come in their mouth. Just touching the corner of the mouth. I did forget to mention that when you transition from a snaffle to a western bit on a horse, first thing you want to do is work them in hand. Now remember, she's 12, probably had a bit, but I did it the other day anyway, just because of safety. And what that means, is you simply take your reins, get them even, and ask the horse to back up. Okay, if they get their feet stuck and then you pull harder, if they've never had a western bit on, they can, they can rear up or fall over backwards. So here you're just a witness, there you're a casualty.
Now what I want you to watch is what's going to happen and I say the word what's going to happen like talks cheap but I already know in my heart right here is where she's going to break and right here is where she's going to break. The weight of the bit is going to take care of the nose. That's the way I see it. Now I'm going to show you another respect thing. Some horses that are smart, you get ready to pull the cinch up and they take their left front foot and they just step out when you pull on it because a lot of people pull straight. If I have a horse that does that, I catch it in midair and I hit it right in the ankle with my boot. Because if they start stepping towards you, they're going to start stepping more. Then they're going to step on you. And I notice now it's legal to ride a horse in go-aheads. So there you go. Now her job this month is to pack this bit. My job is to present myself the best I possibly can. That's the way this works. You don't get on a horse and first thing and grab the bit, which somebody told me, that's how you show them who's boss. Well, that's how stupid they were. You get going forward. Now, she's gonna work this out herself about this bit. What I need to listen to is the cricket. There's the cricket. So now my positions, just as a habit, as I'm riding around outside, I'll be moving my hand around different positions. There. When I'm all done, I'll just have my hand relaxed. But I'm going to move my hand wherever I need to have it to get her to bridle up. Now, today, the gods are in my favor, and she's really nice and light. Now, tomorrow when she wakes up, she might say hell with you, and she's going to be really heavy. Don't take it personal, and don't throw your saddle in the creek. It's just a fact. It's the way horses are. That's why it takes so long to get something done. If you react to everything they do, then you're going to be a nervous wreck. Just get outside, get moving outside, and everything will be just fine. Now, in the past, I've talked about Florida. See there? That's, that's not me pulling. That's her working it out. That doesn't feel all that great. In the past, I talked about Florida, Texas, and California. Well, the connection was that all these states were touched by Spain. And all they were Spanish cattle was what were introduced to them. And they were all on a coastline so they could ship hides and tallow. So that's what made this cattle business go. In the East Coast, they had to clear land into the Alabama and all that country. They had to literally clear the land and drain swamps to get grass. Texas, prairie fires helped, and then when they got done killing all the Comanches, then they had plenty of room to, to make their republic do what it did. Remember, they were a republic. They weren't a state. It was quite a while before they became a state, and that's why they have all deeded land. Starting to fall apart. All right. Now, Hawaii. The cattle business in Hawaii happened 24 years after California, which means it was 272 years after Florida. If you can do geography, you'll know that Florida was the closest to the Caribbean, which is where the Spanish ships left from. They thought they <laughs> Found the Indies, okay. So the first cattle came to Hawaii from Mexico in 1793. And the way I get it, it was a English captain. And he 
they were presented to the king of Hawaii because I guess they'd been doing some trading. Well, the king said, there's no way, these are something we've never seen before. And the captain told him, if you don't kill them and eat them, they'll multiply and then you'll have a lot of cattle. So the king put a, a, a law that said you couldn't kill these cattle. Well, what happened was, was they multiplied, of course, and started tearing up people and gardens and things like that. And they tried walls and it didn't matter. Now they had a whole bunch of feral cattle. Remember, they're word feral because they came over on a ship. Get it? So they had been handled. Now, to, here's one of the questions I want to put out there to the general public, since there's people that like history. They said the first horses came in 1803. Now, the first cattle were in 1793. Okay, where did the first horses come from, and what's the background story on it? I can't find any background story. Now, in 1832, they figured out they needed help, so they got a hold of the president of Mexico, and that's when he sent these vaqueros over. Now, a little trivia for you is they were called Mexican vaqueros by the historians. When they arrived, they told the natives they were Españolas, which means Spanish. They didn't say we're Mexicanos. So it's interesting to me that they're called Mexican vaqueros, but they in fact told the people they were Espanolas, which turned into the word Paniola. Okay, so there's another trivia to look up. And anyway, Veracruz is where I was told the cattle came from, the vaqueros came from, excuse me. Well, Veracruz is on the east side of Mexico. So that means a ship went all the way down the Horn and back up to Hawaii. The entire west coast of Mexico was right straight across from Hawaii. Well, if you know anything about the two years before the mast, as in wooden ships, when they came around the Horn, which is the way they used to go, they had to go to Hawaii and all the way up to Alaska and come back down the coast because of the currents. They couldn't go up. And when they went home, they just got the ship, pointed south, and went right down the coast of South America. So that's why the Veracruz makes sense to me. But I also read that there was cattle sent from Monterey. So... My trivia question of the week is, is tell me the timeline on the Monterey cattle and what they were. Verify that the, the Espanolas slash Mexican vaqueros weren't sent from California. And the story on the horses, just so I can sleep tonight. All right. This horse... Please understand, in a ranch horse mentality, my job is to put her to a cow that I pick and let her, let her natural abilities take over. That's another thing about neck rein. And I've seen people in a corral try to work a cow on a horse like this. So the horse ends up and it looks like a bee western and the, and the cow goes by the human. And then the father gets mad at the husband and the wife, which somebody else wanted to know about cowboy etiquette. Well, I'll give you one short little story if you don't mind. I'm letting my horse think. Is there's a saying that when I lived up north, and like a bunch of guys are standing around the parking lot waiting on the groceries for the wives are shopping, and you're talking about everybody because that's what you do, and one guy says, well, did you hear she handed him the reins? And everybody just kind of goes, oh... That's like a death sentence. Handed him the reins up north for where I was at means that the husband one too many times asked his wife and children or just his wife to help him trail cattle just to another stackyard. Of course, it's zero or ten below. And that just to another stackyard took them six hours by the time they got there. And then either at the stackyard or when they get out of the pickup, she hands him the reins out when she gets her horse and says, here. Now what she tells him to do with those reins and that horse depends on the lady. But in the cowboy world, when somebody says she handed him the reins, that's, that's it. She quit. She didn't divorce him, but she quit. And she'll never get on a horse again and help him. 
So, there you go. Of course, I've never just done that to you. No, my wife, my wife's never done it because, if you'll notice, you haven't seen any videos of working cattle. Well, it's been hotter than hell lately, and that ain't going to happen. And if I even think my bride might break a nail, I'm not going to ask her to go with me. 70 degrees and a light breeze, that's when you ask your wife to go. And then she has the option of trotting home anytime she wants. Okay, that's how a happy marriage works. So now I'm going to show you what I told you a long time ago about a horse and a bridle. I'm going to pick up the reins on this horse. And this horse's job is to shift its weight to the hindquarter. If it loads up the hindquarter, I'm borderline giddy. If it doesn't, that means it's still mind is pushing on the forehand. There's the reins. There's the horse. That's what I'm after. Now the feet won't move after they're broke. But I want them to load up the hindquarter because they are a ranch horse. I want their head up where they can see so they don't end up doing a somersault. That's the different the way you set up the frame of a, a ranch horse as opposed to any other kind of horse. There. Alright folks, this is the last time you'll see this horse for a while unless it all goes to hell and I'll be back and start over. But uh, I've got another horse coming and I would like to tell you that for all the babbling I do, we haven't even scratched the surface. Because there's something I learned is that you never say whoa in a horse race. And we're in a horse race. We have the time, we have the weather, we have the place, so we're going to keep making videos. And there's groundwork, roping cattle, doctoring cattle, um, I don't even know. There's just a whole bunch more videos coming because I got another outside horse coming in, you'll see that. Also, we're going to get Chinaco back out. And uh, the long yearling that got his mind changed a month ago, he's about ready to come back into school and start working on groundwork. So there's a lot more coming. And for those of you that are twitchy about me getting out and doctoring cattle, well, I want you to learn something today. Poco a poco. We'll get there. We'll get there. Thank you.